The BRICS bloc is expanding and it will have worldwide implications. What lies ahead for the grouping? Israeli Interior Minister Itamir Ben Gwir has once again made extremely offensive comments about Palestinians. What do they say about the current government of Israel? And Australia and the Philippines have conducted joint military drills in the South China Sea. What is the politics behind this? This is the Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day. And before you go any further, if you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The 15th summit of BRICS leaders concluded in Johannesburg on Thursday and it lived up to its billing as one of the most significant in recent times. The highlight was the expansion of the bloc. Six new countries have been invited to join from January 2024. The leaders also released a statement which had several interesting pronouncements on the world order. To find out more, we have with us Prashant. So Prashant, the BRIC summit has concluded with some interesting developments, including the expansion of the bloc to six new countries. Can you tell us about this? Right, Suranki. So I think uh, prior to the BRIC summit, this was the single biggest question on everyone's mind. Is the BRIC bloc going to expand? Are new countries going to come in? If so, who are going to come in? And we know that you know about 40 countries at various points had expressed interest. I believe at least two dozen countries had officially applied. And uh, I think even among the members at the same time, there was a lot of discussion on, you know, how do you sort of expand a block like BRICS while keeping its character, keeping its goals, and at the same time, trying to sort of increase the footprint it has, increase the kind of relevance it has. And so finally, they've chosen a very interesting uh, set of countries uh, to begin with. I mean, if you, if you take each one of them, you have Argentina, a country going through a grave crisis. In fact, a country which is in some senses a model of what how a country can be destroyed by the IMF, by international financial institutions, and a country which is also very vital for Latin America. So the fact that and Argentina has been brought in itself is a very interesting signal. Yeah, you look at, say, another country like Ethiopia, which actually went through a prolonged civil war, uh, which uh, in, in which the Ethiopian government faced off against a group, the TPLF, which is believed to have strong backing from the United States and the West. And, you know, the Ethiopian government uh, trying to sort of rebuild after uh, the TPLF had ruled Ethiopia before and they had a very different vision of Ethiopia as a fragmented, uh, tribally split country, whereas the new government at IB, IBM was trying to build a different kind of Ethiopia. And that was also one of the reasons for civil war. So again, Ethiopia being brought in very uh, interesting in that sense. Iran, no need to talk about it. We know why you know, Iran faced so many sanctions. So uh, definitely a very interesting move. And then you have Three other very interesting countries, that is, I'm saying interesting a lot, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, all of which are actually very close to uh, the West in various ways. We know that Saudi Arabia, for long, the linchpin of the petrodollar strategy, uh, long decades and decades of relationships with the United States, the UAE also very similar. Egypt, uh, you know, uh, under Abdul Fattah al Sisi has received a huge amount of weapons from the United States. Uh, but also, these countries in recent times have also I think, been considering the possibility of expanding uh, their traditional roles, expanding the kind of cooperation they have with other groups as well. And, you know, for instance, the fact that Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, and India, you all have had good relationships with India, for instance, with China, for instance, and for that matter, with Russia. So the expansion, I think, it's a very, uh, you know, I think it's a very carefully chosen group of six countries. On the one hand, many of them are very resource-rich. Iran, UAE, and Saudi Arabia together bringing a huge amount of, uh, you know, oil reserves. And BRICS has now become one of the leading blocks in terms of oil production, if you look at it, I believe is a, a substantial amount. But also in terms of GDP, also the focus, for instance, on Africa, you have Egypt, you have uh, Ethiopia, South Africa is already there. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of focus. South Af Africa is considered one of the imp most important uh, regions in the future for humanity as a whole. So definitely uh, a lot of focus over there. So uh, I, know I think it's a very calculated, very uh, interesting uh, set of choices. Uh, also, in some senses, I think blunting the Western propaganda that you could see in many media houses in the days prior to the summit, that there was too much disagreement between the BRICS countries. The fact that the BRICS countries, you know, had, uh, they, 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 were, they were just not going to do it because uh, some were more pro-US, some were very anti-US, and these dissensions 
Uh, there was talk that India and Brazil were far more closer to the US, so they would not agree to this. So all that, I think, uh, they figured out a way. I think whatever discuss, whatever differences they may have had, whatever disagreements they may have had, they've sort of negotiated. And I think that really says a lot about BRICS. The fact that BRICS is not some kind of a perfect alliance. It's not the G7 where everyone is you know, subsumed under US hegemony. It's not one of those blocks. BRICS is a block where different countries often have different agendas, but also are pushing for certain similar agenda points. So I think uh, very, uh, what do you call, a lot, of, uh, a lot of hope, I think, from this expansion process. Right. Can you also tell us some, uh, about some of the other key outcomes of this summit and uh, what implications will they have for building a multilateral world? Look at the statement, two or three important things to note. One, there was a lot of talk about the international financial system, and that was addressed. Now, again, important to note that I think some of the Western sources really focused on what was called de-dollarization, and they pitched de-dollarization as the ultimate aim, which was the idea that there would be a new currency. And if there was no new currency, it would probably mean a defeat of the BRICS summit. Whereas I don't think the BRICS countries ever, uh, at least at this point, are really considering an alternative to the dollar properly as of yet. Right now, I think the main focus seems to be on trading in their own currencies or mutual trade between these currencies and the building of infrastructure for that. I think these countries do understand that there are certain risks that uh, trading with the dollar poses, including the fact that sanctions are an ever-present, uh, you know, reality before all of them. The Russia faces them, China faces them. India, when it actually brought bought goods from Russia, faced a lot of criticism from the US for that. So, <clears throat> I think many of these countries have realized that there are certain risks in completely trading in the dollar. They want to consider the option of mutual trade. They have also already initiated some of these experiments, but this will take time. This will take political will. This will take building a particular kind of infrastructure. And I think this summit has kind of set the stage for a lot of that to happen. There's been a definite push as far as that is concerned. Secondly, I think it's very interesting that, you know, they have talked about the United Nations uh, both Brazil and uh, India very keen, and South Africa for that matter, all very keen on uh, getting uh, permanent seats in the United Nations Security Council. I think there's a recognition of the fact that this way the system is structured right now is kind of really unfair towards the global south. So they really pointed out. Interestingly, they have pointed out to the WTO as well, uh, which at some point of time, you know, the United States and its allies really pushed. And now they are the ones really, uh, you know, uh, because they don't want to go into those arbitration mechanisms. So that's also very much on the agenda. So I think overall, a very interesting and progressive statement, which kind of, uh, you know, brings the possibility of uh, multipolarity in terms of both economic structures, in terms of political resolution of various conflicts, in terms of the kind of agenda that is being said, there's mention of climate change also, for instance. So I think a lot of these issues, uh, definitely uh, BRICS taking a very good stand. Now, the important point, again, like I said, my last question, the fact is not that all these countries need at all part of the agenda at this point of time. I think what's important to note that there is space for negotiation, there is space for forging common alliances, there is space for taking a common stand, and there is space for pushing back against some of the, uh, you know, uh, some, some of the points that the global north has been pushing, what you would call the uh, ex-colonial and settler colonial countries have been pushing on the global south. There is a possibility of pushing back against some of that. And I think that is what BRICS represents at this point of time. And considering that uh, ambition, considering that agenda, I think this has been quite a successful summit. Absolutely. Thanks, Prashant, for this update. Our next story is from Palestine, where Israeli Interior Minister Itamir ben gvir said that his right to move around is more important than those of Palestinians. Now, this might sound like a textbook definition of apartheid, and it has, in fact, caused a huge controversy. But this is nothing new for Ben Gwir, who has made such outrageous comments on a number of occasions and has followed it up with outrageous actions too, especially targeted at Palestinian prisoners. We go to Abdul for more. So, Abdul, can you start by telling us about the recent comments made by Ben Gwir and also give us some context and background into who he is and all the controversies surrounding him? Well, Ben Gwir is quite famous now. Uh, he Ever since he became uh, the Minister of Police, Interior Minister in Benjamin Netanyahu's cabinet in last year. Uh, he has been making comments, the comments he made uh, uh, other day, similar comments he has made many, uh, several other times. So what he said on that day is nothing in, in a way new. 
the only thing which surprised the people that one of the ministers in uh, the Israeli government is openly accepting something which is which is considered to be a taboo yet and Israel has objected about uh, kind of uh, being an apartheid state recognized being an apartheid state in the past but uh, one Ben Gur said was primarily uh, basically defines Israel as an apartheid state. Ben Gur said during a press conference uh, with the Palestinian journalist, of course, that uh, his right to move across the occupied territories, of course, uh, whether it is West Bank, East Jerusalem, or uh, any other Palestinian territory, is superior, more important than the right to movement of Palestinians living there. Uh, uh, when he said he, of course, it meant that uh, the, 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 uh, the settler colonial uh, uh, citizens recognized as the citizens of Israel, mm. uh, the Zionist set of uh, uh, people. So uh, uh, he, that is exactly what he said. And that basically, uh, again, you can, as I said before, he has said such things before also. For example, when while talking about Palestinian resistance, he often calls them terrorists and even talks about uh, uh, having a, a death penalty for those who are involved in murder uh, of quote unquote Israeli citizens. Uh, only the Palestinians, by the way, not the uh, other Israeli citizens. So if an Israeli citizen murders an Israeli citizen, there there is no need of a death penalty. But if a Palestinian is found involved in the uh, such crime, then there should be a death penalty. This this is similar thing. Then he has also talked about uh, how Palestinians need to be expelled from the occupied territories uh, and and kind of should be exiled, should be sent into uh, other parts of the world, primarily sticking to the traditional uh, uh, Zionist uh, uh, notion of uh, Jordan being Palestine. So he basically wants to expel all the Palestinians out of uh, uh, historic Palestine and send it to other parts of the world. So, uh, so what he said basically is a repetition of what he believes in. Him being an extremist, some uh, some of the people have identified him as a racist. Uh, 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 he uh, uh, kind of a person who has also openly talked about uh, mass mass ethnic cleansing of the occupied territories. So, what he said uh, other day is not something which is surprising in any way. Right. As you said, this is not the first time he's uh, made such statements. So, you know, what kind of response has he gotten this time and in the past, both within and outside the region? Well, uh, the, the, there is already a very well-known debate uh, in the global polity, uh, in the global uh, arena, primarily uh, the progressive uh, sections of, or the pro you can say, the people who stand with the Palestinian uh, struggle have uh, ha, have known this uh, for a quite well uh, quite uh, some time that israel is an apartheid state the policies it is pursuing inside the occupied territories are basically the policies which were followed by south africa uh, uh, when it had apartheid system before 1994 so uh, 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 the discrimination the restrictions on the movement of palestinians the treatment of Palestinians vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, uh, having different set of policies, then the, the passing of the uh, uh, Jewish national law, which basically even within the uh, Israel, uh, there is creates two kind of different uh, citizens, one Palestinians, Arabs, and the Israelis, and, and claiming that Israel is a Zionist state, completely denouncing the right of the Palestinians. So, uh, uh, so the kind of policies which uh, the Palestinians have been witnessing, both inside 1948 Israel and inside the occupied territories, have basically uh, uh, made it very clear that uh, Israel is an apartheid state and increasingly becoming so, uh, a much more uh, pronounced apartheid state, uh, particularly uh, after the uh, after the coming of Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, government in power last year in uh, November December, so uh, when he said those things, uh, some of the uh, uh, the only thing which is noticeable is some of those those who so far have restrained themselves have uh, 
uh, not to say Israel as an apartheid state have not agreed to the idea of that. They had some disputes saying that, okay, there are discriminations, there mm -hmm. is an occupation, but it is not an occupied uh, apartheid state yet. Even some of them have started questioning uh, yeah. uh, uh, this notion and they have made clearly uh, clear cut statements in on, on, on Twitter and other social media platforms. If you see that more and more people are now uh, uh, are, are kind of willing to see Israel as an apartheid state. Uh, of course, this is not a decisive uh, shift. Of course, as I said before, this is this has been going on for a quite long time. But uh, uh, that has been uh, the case that a large number of people are now uh, much more in, in clear to see what Israel stands for, and particularly under this particular regime. Uh, this is also comes. Uh, this also comes in the context of the increasing violence in the occupied territories. One should not forget that uh, uh, already, according to the UN data, this this is just the eighth month of 2023 ha has been the deadliest uh, year on record yeah. uh, in the occupied territories, particularly in West Bank, and more than 200 people, Palestinians have been killed in the repeated raids. And then there are uh, settlements are increasing on a regular basis. And the settler violence has been allowed to uh, uh, increase. Uh, uh, they have been unleashed. In, you can say there is complete impunity. No settler has been found guilty or punished for what they did. And they are doing it increasingly. People are getting Palestinians are getting killed and so on and so forth. So it seems that what Ben Guir said on the, that day has basically uh, made it quite clear uh, uh, for those who did not want to say it all this while that what stands, uh, what Israel actually stands for and, uh, and particularly uh, at this uh, point of time. Right, Abdul. Thanks for this update. And finally, Australia and the Philippines conducted joint military exercises on Friday, August 25th, near disputed territories in the South China Sea. The drill was held near the Scarborough Shoal, an island controlled by China and disputed by the Philippines. The joint military exercises is the first of its kind between the two countries and comes just weeks after recent tensions between China and Philippines at the second Thomas Shoal in the region. Australia's involvement is the latest in the Philippines' attempt to involve foreign players in a bilateral dispute with similar exercises and patrols conducted in collaboration with the US and Japan. We speak to Anish for more. So Anish, this is the first time that Philippines and Australia are holding uh, military exercises of this sort. Can you give us a bit of context and background into this and what uh, does this mean for the tensions in the region between uh, China and Philippines? Yes, I think like we should uh, start off by pointing out that very recently, Philippines and China actually uh, went into a standoff uh, uh, near the Scarborough Shoal, uh, which is one of the disputed set of islands uh, uh, between Philippines and, and China in the South China Sea. So this was uh, quite contentious, quite tense. It created a situation which was like very closely monitored by everybody uh, around the globe at the time and uh, this happened very uh, just a couple of weeks ago and a military exercise of the sort pretty much especially initiated uh, by uh, two countries in the region uh, uh, is creating a sort of like it is only aggravating the tension at this point and uh, we need to understand that like, this is a more multilateral kind of uh, dispute that we're looking at when we talk about South China Sea and it's not just the Philippines um, but also uh, closed a couple of other countries in the region. But the islands in dispute pretty much can be and should be ideally, uh, you know, dealt with through resolution, something that both China and Philippines can do through diplomacy. Uh, but that is not happening. Uh, one of the primary reasons why this is not happening is because the current administration of uh, Marcos Jr., in the Philippines is pretty much uh, taking this very anti-China, very strongly anti-China and very strongly pro-United States. That's the more important part, like the fact that they are more very strongly aligned to US foreign policy uh, creates a situation where tensions are going to keep uh, burning in the region. And that is, that is pretty much part of this uh, whole joint military exercise. And the fact that Australia is also, uh, you know, 
getting uh, getting to become a part of this uh, as a major uh, pivot in the southern Pacific region is also uh, speaking volumes of it. Like this is essentially, uh, you know, in many ways part of a U.S. Uh, extension of uh, U.S. foreign policy of trying to encircle China. And we have spoken about this quite a lot in this show as well. Like this is pretty much an extension of that policy. And that is only going to create more tensions in the region at this point. Can you also tell us more about the role being played by Australia in this uh, encirclement of China? Yeah, it is quite an interesting position that Australia is in right now because obviously there is uh, there has been a lot of back and forth. It is not as ideologically committed to this entire uh, policy of creating tensions with China, provocating or for that matter, even uh, you know, confronting China on pretty much every single issue that we can think of, uh, because obviously China is the biggest trading partner for Australia, and that is something that is quite irreplaceable at this point in time. Uh, no matter how much uh, the uh, Australian elite tries to, uh, you know, make sure that uh, tries to replace or make a sort of a U.S. leaning foreign policy, it is still not going to. Uh, you know, undermine the kind of economic uh, significance that relations between these two countries have. Nevertheless, there is definitely a significant uh, section within the Australian ruling class that does believe that China is a threat. And that is something that they have taken as a given. And we have seen, you know, not hints of that, like very blatant uh, pronouncements of that uh, in the recent years. Uh, we have seen uh, defense papers very recently uh, talking very uh, specifically about like uh, it pretty much uh, parrots U.S. line on what, uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific policy should be. And that is pretty much what Australia has taken up. Uh, we have also seen very uh, recently Australia trying to sign a security pacts with Pacific islands uh, in the region. Vanuatu currently is going through an entire political crisis pretty much because a, a deal of this kind was signed by uh, the Australian, and initiated obviously by the Australian government. So, and all of that being done uh, with China in mind. Uh, so Australia is pretty much trying to uh, become, and we have seen a very similar kind of policy with say South Korea and Japan, Japan specifically in the region. And so in the South Pacific, you have Australia doing the same kind of thing. And that is pretty much creating uh, you know, an extension of US foreign policy and pretty much uh, jeopardizes Australia's own national interest at this point. And uh, it is the same thing with Philippines. Like the, the fact is that Philippines depends a lot on China for a whole host of uh, consumer products. And not just that, they also look for China for a lot of their products uh, to be sold there, like a massive market that cannot be replaced. And so despite that, you have governments uh, primarily uh, pushed by a certain kind of ideological inclination, uh, pushing, you know, Cold War era rhetoric that, and also furthering tensions that need not be there at this point in time. And we have seen in the past that these tensions were, could have at least been kept at bay rather than, uh, you know, kept burning uh, the manner in which it does. So this is pretty much the situation that we are at right now. Right. Thank you, Anish, for talking to us. And this is all we have in this episode of the Daily Debrief. For more details on these stories and for other such stories, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For more video updates, visit our YouTube page. Thank you for watching.